This is Ilm Circle, a learning workshop presented by the Islamic Speakers Bureau of Arizona, or ISBA. ILM stands for Intentional Learning for Mutual Respect, the foundation of what ISBA is all about. Thank you for joining us for part two of Islam in China, which um, Dr. Fazia Tang presented to us, I believe it was about six weeks ago. Um, and I still have my notes and I'm super excited for part two. A brief, brief introduction of Dr. Tang is that she is a retired psychiatrist, journalist, educator, education consultant gardener and a children's book writer. Actually, I think she's written a couple of children's books. Um, and she has studied Islam in China and happens to be, I believe, a personal expert because, you know, she's from there. So uh, please give her some snaps. And Salamikum, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Tang. Thank you so much. Okay, so let me start by sharing my screen. Today, we are going to talk about some unique aspects of Islam in China, and I've divided these into four categories, and I hope not to spend too much time on these. Um, there are lots of slides, but many of them are just pictures, okay? Um, the first one are general characteristics, and okay, let me go through this. Uh, the first one is general characteristics of Chinese Muslims. Second one is our special type of calligraphy called Sinim, which means Chinese. <laughs> um, uh, of Arabic calligraphy. The third one is very, a, a very unique Muslim language that evolved over the centuries, partially organically and partially planned. Um, and it's, uh, we can translate that as the scripture hall language. So it is a specific language only for Chinese Muslims. And fourth, a very new topic that became very popular after uh, 2000, uh, is the women's mosques in China. All right, so here we go. <clears throat> um, as we know, uh, Islam is all over the world, has acquired cultural characteristics depending on where it flourished. So in China, the biggest uh, difference between a Muslim and non-Muslim is whether they eat pork or not. And so, the strange thing is that non-Muslims don't know much about Muslims at all. I mean, I can tell you, I've met a lot of Chinese being Chinese myself, and most of them don't know anything about Muslims. But those who know, know something say, oh yeah, those who don't eat pork, right? You know, so that's the one difference between Muslim and non-Muslim there. And sometimes this difference has been um, focused on to an extreme that's incredible. So since most Chinese, eat pork, and not only eat pork, but I mean, it's their main meat. They eat pork more than anything else, you know, more than any other type of meat. So therefore, when you say you don't eat pork, them, so what do you eat? They don't realize that, wow, there's beef, there's, and it's not they don't realize, but it's very abnormal for them, right? Now, especially outside China, uh, people are more used to the fact that pork is not uh, very common, you know, everywhere the way it is in China. So it doesn't sound so strange to them anymore, but inside China, it still is very strange. Um, here are some photos from, the, uh, from a Chinese Islamic restaurant I went to. So they look pretty much like other Chinese meals, uh, except that of course they don't have pork. All right, so no pork, no lard. And then, like I said, it's going to such an extreme that if they know, um, I'm talking about those who are very strict Muslims, okay? Uh, no, some people that I wouldn't call strict Muslims yet for, when it comes to food, they are extreme, they're still extreme. So if this restaurant uh, uh, sells pork and other dishes, they will not eat there. It doesn't matter that the other dishes are perfectly okay, like seafood, vegetables, no, that's it. We don't eat there because they sell pork. If in your home you have cooked pork, I remember meeting a Malaysian lady who uh, told me that, Malaysian Chinese, right? That, oh, her neighbor in Malaysia was so nice to her. She was Chinese, but non-Muslim. And she invited her over and would eat her house. And I was refused. And I said, oh, why? I said, because she cooks pork. I said, one day she even told me, I have bought a new pot, a new wok for cooking and new dishes. 
and a new uh, ladle and whatever, right? And I bought halal meat from your market. I'm going to cook for you and please come and eat in my house. So, but I refused. I said, why? <laughs> so they are extreme. You did everything, but your home is a home where pork is served. So I will not eat in your house. It's that extreme. Um, I'm not saying it's good or it's bad. I used to tell my father, why are they so extreme? We don't have to do that, you know? If I go to a pizza store, as long as they don't serve me pork, I'm fine with it, you know? And actually, uh, during my stays in Taiwan over the summer, I would work actively on this. I would tell my dad, let's go to this pizza store. Look, they come frozen. They just serve it like that. It doesn't touch anything that has pork on it. It doesn't touch it, you know? So why can't I eat it, you know? Um, anyway, so... However, uh, in the case of alcohol, this is very strange. I'm not talking about Northwest China, but more like in, on the Eastern side, maybe Southeast side, alcohol is very, very common. I went to a restaurant, which was over 150 years old. And it was a huge restaurant, you know, it has three different buildings and had, uh, you know, we were because my mother-in-law and I went back after so many years. So we were invited by all these relatives. So all the Tong relatives uh, um, invited us to, to this fancy place and we were on the fifth floor or something. And we were served by a woman dressed in ancient Chinese clothes and so on. And in the middle of the meal, and they even have a, like a sitting area while waiting for a table to be set up and then going to the table. It's, it's a fantastic place, you know, really, really fancy. In the middle of the meal, this uh, cousin of my husband um, leaned over and asked me, would you prefer red wine or white wine with your food? And I'm like, um, I don't drink wine. And so her husband wanted to know what we were talking about was going like this. And he says, oh, why? You don't drink wine? I said, no. Uh, you mean Muslims in America don't drink wine? And I said, Muslims all over the world don't drink wine. He says, and my mom-in-law was feeling embarrassed because, um, you know, here is her daughter-in-law bringing shame on the host, you know? I said, ha, 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 it's okay, it's okay. In Nanjing, the Muslims drink wine, it's okay, it's okay. And I'm like, I can't say anything because I don't want to make them look bad, but it was very common there. I remember when I was a child, my father also drank, not every day, occasionally when he had he attended functions, diplomatic functions. It was not until I was, I think, around 20 that he stopped. And maybe before that, because when I went back to live at home, um, he and my mom, my mom was, became an expert. She would put Chinese tea and add water to it and keep looking, looking until the, the, the color looks just like whiskey. <laughs> And the two of them would go out and, and sort of, uh, you know, toast everyone, pretend they were drinking wine, okay? And I was telling my father, but if you pretend, they will think you are drinking wine. And he says, but I have to, because it's my job. I said, no, you don't have to, you know? And thank God, by the time my sister's husband became a diplomat, he didn't have to. My sister wore a hijab, they never drank wine and they were fine, you know? So um, I guess either things have changed or my father's faith wasn't strong enough, one of the two. <laughs> um, my theory as to why this is so, especially on the east and southeast side of China, my theory is that if you remember, this is where the earliest Muslims came, even before they moved to Medina, even before the Hijrah. And we know that when the Quran came down, they first told us not to be drunk while at prayer. And it was in steps that eventually, eventually alcohol was banned, right? So I'm wondering whether it, it, because it came so early that it froze in time, you know what I'm saying? So it could be that, the, you know, because customs and people's behavior are slow to change. Edicts, laws are easy to change, but people's behavior is slow to change. I'm thinking that might be the reason. Whereas the later Islam came in through the Silk Road from the West and the people in Northwest China don't drink at all. Okay, so that's a very strange dichotomy here. Um, but if you see some restaurants which are opened by foreigners in China, there's no alcohol there. 
I remember uh, I went to uh, San Jose, I think, one year, many years ago, um, at least 20 some years ago, and there was a new Islamic Chinese restaurant there. We were very happy we went there and we looked and looked, we finally found it in this little strip mall. And we told him, why don't you put something on top? So we know we've been looking or we didn't know which one was your restaurant. And he says, oh, I had to take it down. I said, why? He said, because you know, all these Arabs and Pakistanis that come here and they're mad at me because I have alcohol here. <laughs> well, you're not in China or in Taiwan right now. It's not done, okay? <laughs> Um, all right, the Chinese Muslims also eat spe some special food. Some are eaten only by Muslims, and some are so popular that everybody eats them, whether they're Muslims or not. One of them is the famous ramen. When they say ramen now, that's what they mean, ramen, but the ramen is not done this way. They make the noodles by hand. They pour them by hand in seconds, okay? And actually there are two stores that have opened, two restaurants have opened here in Phoenix, in the Phoenix area. Um, I can tell you where they are if you are interested, that make hand pulled noodles. Um, they are very, very tasty by the way. So uh, Lanzhou is the capital of Gansu and it's now called the Lamian from Lanzhou. And all over China, you find restaurants called Lanzhou Lamian. Um, they are not necessarily Muslim, but you have to ask. I, I, are you Muslim? Do you have halal meat or not? You know, but uh, and the two here are not, by the way. They are made by people, but they are not uh, Islamic, unfortunately. Um, now, a lot of uh, the the customs and culture in Northwest China, China among Chinese Muslims, like among the Uyghur here in Xinjiang, are influenced by the culture from uh, Central Asia because a lot of there was. Some of them came from there or went to there and so on and so forth. So this is a bread stall in Xinjiang. And when I went in 2019 to Uzbekistan, I went to the green market in Tashkent and this is one of the bread stalls there. I mean, do you see something similar there, right? Very similar. And you know what we call shish kebab. In Kazakhstan, they call it shashlik. So I went here to this lake called Kaindi and by the side of the lake, somebody was, you know, barbecuing these things and every single piece of beef is about this big okay if you go to china and you go to any xinjiang restaurant where they sell skewered they're very delicious the taste is lovely by the way lots of cumin turmeric and so on but the size i, I had to make a close-up so you can see the size of the beef is about like um like my nail you know <laughs> it's, it's pretty much like little pieces of my, 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 my thumbnail. Uh, I remember when we, in, in, we were in Tashkent and our tour guide, he's, he, this one was a guy, he took us his restaurant and we're eating these uh, barbecued beef. And I told him, oh, by the way, you know, in China, we have these two, the, in Xinjiang, the Chinese women say, Hif, the Chinese, yes. I said, what? He said, their meat is that cannot put it in, you know, in, the, in the hole between my teeth. You know, meat has to be, oh, well, well, that's meat. They don't know how to cook meat. <laughs> so. Whatever. Um, another food called Youxiang. So this is my mom-in-law, uh, Sister Azra, I'm sure you remember her. So my mom-in-law years ago, when we first moved here, every single year on the anniversary of her mom's death and her father's death, she would be making these um, fried bread. i have called them fried bread. They're very similar to the Native American fried bread. Um, it's kind of dough, and then you shape it like a pancake and you fry it. She made them quite big actually and very flat, but um, I've eaten it in other people's homes and they are usually raised. So, and if you make it well, it's, and if, while you fry it, it sort of puffs up, okay? So they are smaller in diameter and it puffs up. And for the longest time, I used to ask my dad, like, why do Chinese Muslims eat youxiang? Youxiang literally means oil fragrance, okay? when somebody dies or there's a funeral because the first time I ate it was when I went back to Taipei. And when we came out of Jumha, somebody was out there distributing bags of this fried bread. And um, I was saying, what's that? My father said, just take it. So I took it, he said, what's that? He said, oh, somebody in his family died, okay? So he's giving the other words. I said, what for? He said, just take it. And I was thinking, why? I've never seen, all the years I've been in the Middle East, I've never seen anyone cook fried bread when somebody dies or on the anniversary of somebody's death. It's just not done, but why do all Chinese Muslims do that? I never knew why until I went to Kazakhstan. So this is like really interesting. When I went to Kazakhstan, you see this is the same, but smaller 
in, in, in diameter. So it, when it puffs up, it almost look round, right? And they call it bowersack. It's very, um, they eat it all the time, but especially when somebody dies, they have to cook it. So this young lady was my tour guide when I went in the mountains of Almaty and she took me to this uh, typical uh, Kazakh village uh, made of, um, you know, the, the tents, the round tents, the yurt, okay? And they were serving me this and she started giving me her little spiel. I said, stop, can I record you? She said, sure. So now let's listen to what she had to say, okay? Oh, my mouse. Okay, there you go. Tell me about this, uh, the borsak. Tell me about it. So this borsak, it's a type of plastic bread. It's famous here. Usually it's served in uh, special events like wedding or memorial. So when you cook it in memorial day, uh, we have belief uh, that the aroma of uh, oil and frying borsak goes to the dead love so they can smell aroma and enjoy them with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So did you hear what she said, the aroma of the oil being fried? And in Chinese, it's called oil aroma or oil fragrance, okay? That's exactly what she said. Now think about it. In Islam, do we believe that dead people can smell anything? No. So this is a cultural tradition that predates the advent of Islam in Central Asia. So before Islam came there, they all believed in also one God, but it was called uh, Tengri. And so uh, it's often called Tengrianism or something like that, their, their religion, which uh, is all the way in Central Asia, all the way to Mongolia and so on. And they call their God Tengri. So I believe, I think I have to go back. That's why I say I have to go back and study this more in depth. I believe that it must be a leftover um, trait from Tengriism, okay? not from Islam, because in Islam, you don't believe that the dead can smell anything, okay? Um, so this is exactly what the Chinese say. So I said, now I get it. That's where they got it from, okay? So when they moved into China from Central Asia, they brought the tradition with them and it stayed on, though it has nothing to do with Islam. All right, in Xi'an, which is a, also a city with, Xi'an is the place where everybody, all tourists go to see the, the, the Ping Ma Yong, the terracotta soldiers, okay? And Xi'an has an entire area called the Muslim Quarter. And they have developed it to be, because they know uh, how tourists love Islamic food. So they develop, developed it very much and you can go there. And um, like my husband said, you start from one end of the street, you eat all your way down to the other end of the street. <laughs> and um, when my son and two of my daughters went there as a school trip one year, so in the evening, they had the choice of free time or going to this uh, performance. So they said, no, we don't want the performance. We'll go have free time. So they went to this place and he said, this is the best food we ate in the whole trip. And the other places they serve like Americans. I didn't know about Chinese. They were serving like nonsense food. But there they said they ate the best. And there were like eight of them and they ate so many things. And they, 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 they described to me, they had this soup and that noodles and this and the dumplings and this and that and it all cost around five to $6, okay? <laughs> um, so yeah, it's delicious, it's halal and it's cheap. Um, in China, you will find even a lot of halal stores, Muslim stores, where they sell all kinds of halal food. So this, as you know, is ramen noodles, but it's halal. And um, because you may not know, but uh, in other countries in, in the East, uh, they, they might use a lot of lard in there. Um, this one is uh, the material put in a hot pot. Um, and this one is also a spicy one that you can put in, this, in your sauce. This one is uh, like jerky beef. Okay, all kinds of things. And I, when I went to the train station, in the train station, there was a little, little convenience store that was only halal, unbelievable. I bought one packet and I opened it. It's like cooked meat. The meat is already pre-cooked. And all you can do is buy one of those ramen noodle thing. You put hot water in there and you drop the meat in there and you just eat it right there, you know? Okay, decorations. So you can see here is typical regular this is Yasin, part of Yasin, uh, that you can find in any Arabic uh, place anywhere in the world. But the mounting, as you can see, is typical Chinese. Here, on the other hand, you can see that the, the uh, we will talk more about this later on in the, in the section on calligraphy. This is typical Chinese calligraphy of 
of Arabic. And you can see the blend, the blending of Chinese culture. This thing on the right, the, this, this Chinese character is not a real character. It's two characters put together. So it's happiness, happiness, and you put it together, it becomes double happiness. And we put this usually for weddings and stuff because one guy happy, two, the ladies happy, two of them are happy to get, you know. So you use that, you, you put it, for example, on, on piece of paper that you hang red papers, or you put it on um, uh, the bedspread that you make for the newlywed and so on and so forth. So this, the double happiness is typical Chinese. But you see here, they have la ilaha la around it <laughs> because this is for Muslim weddings, okay? Here you can see Arabic written on this, but it's a fan. So the Chinese like to write stuff on the fans and put them as decoration on, as a huge fan on the wall. So it's a blend of Chinese and Islamic culture. Um, there are many other things like, uh, like pots, vases, the tea sets, cups, and so on. Unfortunately, uh, last year, the government banned any foreign inscriptions. So on restaurants, if you have the word halal, you have to take it off. Um, and my son-in-law, one of his company, he has two companies, so one of them, he, he has a, a, a genuine um, a ceramic factory where they make tea sets, cups, and so on and so forth. And they would have, so this, uh, they would have, like you see here, Islamic inscriptions on them. Unfortunately, he just stopped production right now because he cannot, he's not allowed to anymore. And this is a pity, obviously. And you can see here, incense burners are very, very, um, very, very um, popular among Chinese Muslims. And these little hats, as you can see, have more Central Asian character. Here, of course, the fans, again, this is not a real fan, it's just a piece of wood, but uh, they use the, the fan theme again. This isn't very Chinese. Um, we are going to have a whole section on this, but as we said, the Chinese have developed their own style of Arabic calligraphy using Chinese methods, okay? Uh, principles of Chinese calligraphy, but developed as uh, <clears throat> Arabic. And then we have another section on Tinkai, but they have developed their own specific vocabulary that only other Chinese Muslims understand. <laughs> so they could be talking, talking, and you're thinking, what the heck are they talking about, right? And, but it's all, um, um, let's look at it, for example. A lot of words are from the Persian. Uh, this is when I went to Uzbekistan. I took this picture on the wall and they call it namaz. And I know that in Pakistan, they also say namaz, not salah, okay? And this is the time. The fajr is called bomda, peshin. Now, this is a strange one. They call this asal, which is Arabic. Then shom and huftan, huftan, actually. Now, look at it in Chinese here. The Chinese words here, pamta, okay, bomda. Pieshuni, Pieshin, Pieshin, Pieshin. Now, this is the asal, it's called Tikalei, Tikalei. I have, so I don't know why here they call it asal. I mean, this is one odd one out over here. Shamo. I remember my mom in law, my dad in law, they used to say, hey, time to pray Shamo, Shamo, Chili, Shamo. I'm thinking, what Shamo? Because Shamo sounds like desert. Let's go and pray desert. I'm thinking, what are you talking about? And she says, oh, it's what you call Maghrib, okay? And Huftan here is a Hufutan, Hufutan. And Juma is called Juma, okay? Juma, of course, isn't from Arabic. The Azan is called Panke, which I think must be Persian, not Arabic, obviously, because Arabic. But you know what? I went online, I Googled modern Farsi, and it's also called Azan. So I said, well, it must be then some kind of ancient Farsi, because everywhere in Northwest China and among Muslims, they call it Panke, okay? The khutbah is called words, which must be Farsi also, because obviously it's not. So uh, this is interesting. You see, this is the Beijing Ox Street Mosque, okay? They put it here in Chinese, which is actually Farsi. And they put here in Arabic, which is real Arabic and real Fajr, Zohor, Rasal, and so on. <laughs> so it is really interesting how everything's mix, mix, mixed and matched here. In Taiwan, Hong Kong, and many other more modern mosques in China, they now don't use those uh, terminology anymore. They say chen li, which means dawn prayer. Xiang li means noon prayer. For example, huan li means uh, sunset prayer. Okay, so it, it actually go by the meaning of the, the, the words in Arabic. Here is another one from China, and you can see here, bandan, bamda, and here, peshin, and here, uh, pikri, 
the, the one that we, the Asr one, Sham and then Khuftan. Okay, so they still have the, the, the Farsi words up here. And of course, some terms are from Arabic. I would say Juma. If you say Assalamu alaikum, Salam, hey, Salam, say Salamu. Aid is Arda. Dead body is mighty. I, I remember because when I went to, uh, to Taipei to the mosque, the, the day when the guy was handing out the, 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 the little pancakes, the fry bread, suddenly everyone said, make way, make way for the Mayita, Mayita. Mayita said, what Mayita, Mayita? Oh, Mayita, Mayita, you know, in Arabic, the, the dead, the dead body, right? But they say mighty, mighty. And, and, but many other words, like even they say Urdu, but they have now uh, developed actual Chinese words for them. Like Kajajie actually means break fast festival, okay? Jiaishengjie means sacrifice festival. And Zhongxiao, but sometimes they call Zhongxiao, which is a totally Chinese way of saying, which is the feast of loyalty and filial piety, so, which sounds very, very Chinese, but it is Eid al Adha. And you think about it, yeah, it's loyalty and filial piety, what they did, Ibrahim and, and Ismail, right? I just put this picture out of interest. I don't know where it is from, it's from Google. <laughs> You see, it's a, they, they say that this tree is a ma li shu. Li is a kind of chestnut, okay? And they put ma li shu <laughs> on top. <laughs> Very interesting. All right, burial rites, as I was going to put, but it was too much work to cut and paste that video. I was going to cut just a little bit of it. Uh, there's a lady from Yunnan, a Chinese Muslim lady called uh, Lao, Lao Tai Are. Okay, I, 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 uh, I put, I always, I follow her and she has a, a lot of followers and every video she puts is, so she's a Muslim and she puts a lot of Islamic stuff over there, either something she cooks. And that one was a burial, a funeral she went to, which is amazing by the way. Um, and you can see the influence of Sufism in, in their burial rites and so on. So this is another thing we said pork was one thing. The second thing that differentiates non-Muslim from Muslims in Chinese in China is burial. Over there, burial is a big thing. You know, the coffin, the rites, the whatever. It's it's a big thing, and uh, you see often in these dramas, you know, on television, a girl kneeling on the on the floor in the street and say, "I'm selling myself. I'm selling myself. Please, somebody buy me." And they say, "Why you're selling yourself?" Say, "Because I don't have money to bury my father." And it's an extreme sin for a child not to bury their parents. So this big burial thing is a huge thing. And they don't have enough money to bury them because it has so many things involved, not just a coffin, but also a lot of things you have to burn paper this and paper that and all kinds of things you have to do and buy food and put a big head and whatever, <laughs> whatever. So a lot of things you have to do, a lot of money to be spent and they don't have the money. So they, they, they would be rather selling themselves into slavery than not bury their parents. And the Muslims were known for have very simple burial, just a white piece of cloth. My God, are you so poor? Because for example, in the biography of the founder of the Ming emperor, he buried his parents and his brother who all died of this epidemic in a white shroud. So they said he was that poor. He was so poor, he couldn't afford to bury his parents properly. <laughs> but we all know better, don't we? Um, there is a very famous bestseller in 1988 written by a Chinese Muslim called, in Chinese it's called The Burial of Muslim. But when they translated into English, called it The Jade King, because it's about the family that, that made and sold jade um, sculptures, you know. And it became a huge bestseller. And this book has become uh, quite, um, a kind of reference for many people who want to know how Chinese Muslims live and talk and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, there's some of the things she says are not quite accurate Islamically. They may be accurate in the description, but Islamically, well, her, 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 and her presentation is sometimes not accurate. Um, So the normal Muslims um, are recorded in a book called, people call it the hundreds, not hundreds, these hundreds, because in, Chinese, in Chinese words, you don't have an S, so you don't know whether that word is in plural or singular, right? So it's called hundreds family names. And it has about 472 characters, a few of them uh, being a family name with two characters. So most Chinese that you meet, if they tell you I mind family name such and such, their name is up here. It's supposed to cover all the Chinese family names. But 
uh, oh, and generally a family name is consists of three characters, like my name, for example, is Mai Tai Chi. My family name is Mai. My generation name, which they call the scripture hall, no, the, the, the hall character, the hall name, because every family has a temple, which is called a hall, right? And then they have a book with inscriptions in it. And you follow the, 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 so every word would be the generation name for the next generation. Okay, so um, my family temple is called Shao De Tang in Henan, actually. That's what my father told me. And so my second name would be a generation name, and the third name is my name proper. So my name is Mai Dai Qi, my elder sister is Mai Dai Wen, my third sister is Mai Dai Hua, and my younger sister is Mai Dai Lei. My brother is different altogether. <laughs> so may some people choose to have only two words and they skip the generation name, like my husband, for example. This thought it was very modern and cool to have just two names, Tong Shu. But his father didn't want him to forget his generation name. So he gave the Arabic name, all starting with Mu, like Mubarak, Murad, Muhammad, no, Muhtar, so that they will remember that your, uh, your middle name was Mu, okay? Mu, okay, Mu. Okay, um, but Ch Mu Chinese Muslims have a Chinese name in the traditional format but they also have an Arabic name called the scripture name, the Jingming. So when I was born, I had my Chinese name, but then my father would go to the Imam and say, please give her a name. And he called me Fauzia, right? So we have two names. And the last name of the family, again, this is a very interesting thing. So we are going to go, uh, uh, there are two types. One type like my family name, Mai, or my husband's family name, Tong, is, a, f a name not found in the hundreds family names. It is a very weird name. So Mai, for example, means to buy. So people say, oh, when I first went to Taiwan, I wrote my name. I was having terrible Chinese in those days. So, so they said, you spelled it wrong. Should, there should be a, 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 a horizontal bar on the top. It should be Tia. I said, no, my name is not Tia, it's Mai. They thought I misspelled it. I, then Mai, there's no such name. I said, yes, there is, it's my family name. <laughs> Um, my husband named Tong is written in a very weird way. So when my daughters went to, to school and um, in, in ASU, they have Chinese classes and signed up for the Chinese uh, 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 flagship program. The teacher would look at their name and says, did you misspell it? Said, no, 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 that is my name. And say, how do you read it? <laughs> or the teachers, some, some of them, they want to lose face. So the professor would say nothing, go home and check up how to read this word. <laughs> because it is a very rare character, okay? So how did we get these weird names? They used to have, so um, my, like for example, my name, they, my father said came from Mas'ud, but in Chinese means to buy. Some people are called Huo, Huo means fire, whose name is fire, right? But we think come from Huo Seng. So, you know, all the Chinese names have one syllable. So they take the first and sometimes the last syllable. A lot of people are called Ting. I, I have a friend um, in LA, her name is Ting Zhenghui. And her father was the Imam of the Grand Mosque in Taipei at one point after he retired. And so like Saad Din, Shamsud Din and so on, anybody ending in Din often was called Ting or Ting. Ha, you can tell it's Hassan, right? Or something like La. I met recently somebody from LA, a professor called Professor La, okay? And we think it could be Abdullah, for example, right? Hai, like Haider or something. Who could be Hussein, could be Hussam, could be. And so we can, so all of these names are names that are unique to Muslims and not found among non Muslims. Then you have other people who have names like my son in law is Wu. Wu is a very common Chinese name to non Muslims. And there are people called Zhang, some people called Ting, like we said, Wang. Wang is a very, very, my mom in law is called Ma. But they said, out of 10 Ma's in China, nine are Muslims. So Ma, meaning horse, is actually a very common name in China. But Mahmoud, a guy named Mahmoud took his first syllable and called it Ma, which happened to be also a common name in China. So, oh, great. Okay, you sound very Chinese now, right? So, so like Li, apparently is from somebody called Ah Li, right? So become Li, which is the Li of many Chinese people are called Li, right? But there are many theories as to uh, where they came from. During, if you remember in the, the last presentation, we talked about how during the Ming era, uh, the, the emperor had a decree that the Muslims or, or 
actually not just Muslim, but Mongols also and so on, were not allowed to marry their own ethnicity. They had to marry outside. So when they married somebody who was a Han, that person, whether it's a wife or a husband, had to, to convert to Islam. And that's how suddenly we became that many Muslims by the end of the Ming dynasty, right? Millions and millions, whereas before we, I think there were barely five millions at the beginning. And um, at least 20, 20, because they killed up to 20 uh, million during the Qing dynasty, so it had to be more than 20 million, maybe four, 40, 50 million. Um, and that was because simply through intermarriage with non-Muslims who had to convert. Okay, so if the daughter married to a husband who was Han who converted, then obviously that would be a Han family name. Sometimes uh, there are actual stories of people who wanted to marry uh, the daughter of, uh, of a Han family. So they said, all right, you may. But once you get a child, the first son has to take my family name and the other children can take your family, no problem. So at least they would have somebody in their family name, right? Um, and then thirdly, some people, the family name came from the emperor. If you render service to the emperor and he gives you as a present, the, he grants you a lot of stuff, including a family name, you have to take it. One of the famous one is Zheng He, right? Zheng He, the famous navigator that everybody teaches about in sixth grade of world history. That Zheng He, his family name was Ma He, actually he was Ma, his name was Ma, like my mom-in-law, Ma. But when he, uh, he rendered, he entered the service of the emperor, they changed his name and he became Zheng, okay? Um, another a special thing that Chinese Muslims have, they don't have to bow. Back in the days of the emperor, you don't need, didn't have to only bow, you have to act a koto on, you have to mix the jute on the floor to the emperor. And that is why a lot of people refuse to work for the emperor because then you have to bow and you have to koto, except in the Ming dynasty, right? By the time uh, it was a Republican era after 1911, um, a lot of, uh, since the, a lot of uh, Muslims were in martial arts or were, in, were warriors, they, 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 they served the Republic, but they, they were given the special privilege not to bow. So they didn't have to bow to the, to the president or to the father of the nation, to his picture most of the time. And this, for example, was the Minister of Defense. He didn't have to bow. We just nod their heads, that's all. Um, the mosque architecture is very, very special. So in places closer to the West, like here in Xinjiang, you can see that it has a lot of uh, characteristics of mosques in Central Asia. However, the more you go to the East, like here in Beijing, the more it retains a Chinese character, okay? Uh, the mosque in Beijing was built actually in 996. It's very, very, very old, but it was raised and rebuilt during the Ming Dynasty. Remember the Ming Dynasty? So. If you read uh, the book I was talking, I'm going to talk about later on at the end, uh, they say, oh, unfortunately, the Ming Dynasty, the Muslims were oppressed. No, they were not. They're not just getting this whole thing wrong. They were not, okay? And that's why a lot of mosques were built or rebuilt during the Ming Dynasty. Um, of course, here, many of these pictures were taken by me when I went there. <laughs> I had to go there when I went to Beijing, right? Um, oh, I wanted to show you the, this thing. Did you see the columns? Okay, so often in Chinese uh, architecture, you have on both sides of the wall of, the, of a door or a window. If you have a column, like in this case, it would be on the column, you have a set of poetry. So one sentence, one verse on the right, one verse on the left, and they are matching verses. And Chinese words, of course, come in little squares like that, right? These are Arabic words, as you can tell but they are written in such a way they look like Chinese characters because they are written in little squares. Okay, diamonds, okay, they are sideways a little bit. So they are Arabic words and they look very Chinese. Here it says, non-Muslims, please refrain from entering the prayer hall. Those with tight or short clothing, please refrain altogether from entering the hall at all, right? So this is the main prayer hall in that. And it says, Qingzhen, like we said, pure and true, Gu Jiao, ancient religion. The minaret there, this is what it looks like. <laughs> Chinese minaret, okay? And they call it what? Pang Ke Lo. Remember what we said, Pang Ke is Azan? So it means Azan Tower, okay? And this is what it looks like. Um, I took a picture from inside. It was, we were not allowed to go up, so I took a picture from down. 
And here is a moon observation tower. As you know, uh, for Ramadan, we have to observe the moon. So on this one, they go up there to look for the moon. Again, Chinese architecture. This is a men's ablution room. This is a, another parent uh, who went with me because I was on a, I was a parent, um, um, what do you call it, um, chaperone <laughs> on the trip that my daughter had to go to for the Mother United Nations. So this, so while they were having the conference, we were free to do whatever we wanted. So I told them, I'm going to the, uh, uh, to the Ox Street Mosque. So they said, oh, we want to go too. We said, okay, come with me. <laughs> so I took them there. So here it says male water rooms. So this is a male ablution area. And there is a female mosque. Again, we are going to talk more about female mosques in the, our section four. And I think I'm taking too much time. What time? I had better watch my time and talk too much. Okay, I better be fast. Um, when I was there, there were two women inside. The one was teaching the other to read Quran. So I would bet anything, this is one of them is a female scholar or even imam. And the other one is just a regular woman who's trying to learn the Quran and she was teaching her. When I asked them if I could take their pictures, of course they refused. Um, so. I said, can I take it from the back? So this is with their permission, by the way, okay? Now, there's a female bathroom called the female water room, okay? And we are talking about that more in the section on female mosques. This is North, uh, Northern Lecture Hall. And the, the original entrance was from here. Now the entrance is in a different place. Now, I want you to point out something. What do you notice on the roofs? This is a Qilin, a Chinese mythical uh, animal. You know how uh, in very, very strict, uh, among strict Muslims, they say you cannot put sculptures of anything with eyes. Well, I'm sorry, the Chinese Muslims didn't have that problem, it seems. <laughs> and this was built in 900 something, okay? 900 something. And they had these mythical animals with horns and so on sitting on the roofs, okay? And see, they're all there, all there along the roofs. So many of them. And you have these vases, again, a copper cauldron to cook meals for the entire congregation. And this one is in 19, remember I told you that the first emperor, the minute he became emperor and during the first year of his reign, he built this mosque. So this is the mosque still open for prayers and for activities. Again, they're selling the breads in front and this is the entrance, okay? And this was um, Juma, not Aida, it is even more. Um, here is a mosque in Xi'an. Okay, it's one of the four great mosques and one of the oldest one built in 742 um, during the Tang Dynasty. Okay, and I don't know if this thing is covering up the image. Can you see the image clearly? Yeah. Now in Beijing, this whole district for Muslim is called Ox Street. So there used to be a street where they used to sell obviously beef, which was very strange because most people ate pork, right? So it was called Ox Street or Cow Street, whatever. And um, eventually it became an entire district. So you can hear, for example, Ox Street, Fourth Alley. Okay, so it's a different, the different side streets. And then there's an entire community area, which is entirely Muslim. For example, they would build a whole division of apartment blocks all for Muslims, okay? Here again, for uh, Ox Street, West, um, Western part, okay. Uh, second sub part, okay, whatever section, whatever. Uh, and here you see Hui Min Xiao Xue, um, Hui People Elementary School, okay. So there's a lot of elementary school and middle or high schools called uh, for the Hui Muslims but their curriculum is like the same as a public school. So I said, what's the difference? And the difference is the lunches are all halal. <laughs> I, uh, somebody right here in Phoenix that I know very well, she didn't tell me until like a couple of years after I knew her that she was Muslim. She was originally Muslim. She doesn't say that because obviously she's not behaving like Muslim anymore. And I would bet anything her husband's not Muslim and her husband eats pork. And I was wondering because her daughters have these big eyes, which are very rare among normal Chinese. And I, I'd been wondering. So she opened this school where they, they teach uh, Chinese cultural dancing and so on and so forth. And they're, they're amazing. But she told me that she went all her life to uh, an Islamic or Muslim, not Islamic, Muslim elementary and high school when she was in China. 
And she told me that the food is halal, that's why. <laughs> this is in Pingliang, which is a small town in Gansu, in Northwest China. So actually my son-in-law's parents live there. And that's my daughter and my son-in-law when we went to visit them after they got married. And so on the way in the train, I kept taking pictures because I saw these holes in the mountains with doors and windows. And I was trying to, every time I whip up my phone, it, I said, ah, it's gone. So my son is a mom, what are you trying to do? I said, I'm trying to take pictures of these, of these holes that people live in. He says, mom, we have one right in our backyard, okay? I said, okay. So we got there and this is right in their backyard in D. So here you can see this one is their backyard. So in the yard, they plant all the things that they need to eat, veg veggies, corn, you can see here and so on and so forth. And they do dig holes in the mountains and they use them for storage, okay, for storage of things. But up the hill a little bit above, there were other ones and here's one. He's, uh, you can see obviously it used to be somebody's home, but it's now vacant, okay? So in the rural areas, there are many Muslims that still live in caves. This is, um, so my, my, my son-in-law's parents are supposed to be like, they are in this small so-called rural. To me, it looks urban. In America, you know, rural means really rural. But in China, there are so many people that this counts as rural, this small town. And they, they have this new house that the children built for the, them. And this is a very beautifully made Kang. So what is a Kang? In North China, Northwest and Northeast China and North China, North Central, they used to have these elevated beds. So this one, please have a seat, please have a seat. And I'm thinking, what am I supposed to say? I start sitting in the corner. No, please have the upper seat. And think, what's the upper? So you're supposed to climb on this thing and you can sit cross-legged on this whole thing. And they would have little tables you can put on it. You can just, just sit there. In the winter, and I know what the Kang is, they have fire that puts smoke inside and it heats up the place. So when you sit on it, it's nice and warm, okay? Just like in Saudi Arabia, you sit on the floor and you have these floor things to sit on, but this is not the floor because it's too cold on the floor. So they heat it. So here I am lifting the edge and looking. My son-in-law saying, mom, what are you looking for? I said, I'm looking for the hole where you put the things to burn. He said, mom, it's not indoors. It makes smokes. I said, oh, oh, stupid me, right? So he, I said, where is it that? So he took me outside and he showed me, this is a place where there's a hole. And there are some bricks there. So you put the coals and the woods and whatever inside, you burn it there. The smoke goes into this thing. You see it's against the wall. And this thing becomes nice and warm and can sit on it. And they gave me the best seat. Please sit on it, you know. <laughs> Interesting. And so um, when we went there, it was a bit before Ramadan. Oops. And they have something there called the welcoming Ramadan party. And I, I didn't know that it was a thing, by the way. So obviously this is a habit they, uh, they have from Central, uh, a custom from Central Asia. So they, they do have a kitchen and like this is the kitchen. See this little house there is their kitchen. And the kitchen is not attached is to the house. It's separate because Chinese cooking has a lot of oil and smoke and stuff, but it wasn't enough to cook for the hundred people that came. So the mom had all these other cookers put out there and and you can see the size of the table is not very big. And they were able to actually fit about 100 people in there. Amazing. And um, I was looking, but I lost the recording. I actually recorded. So they invited like five or six imams to come to recite the entire Quran before we ate. Now, you know, that takes a long time, right? And I was wondering how they were going to do it. So what happens is that every imam gets one or two juzu, okay? And they recite, um, I, I'm not trying to make fun of them. I'm just, I had the recording, but I lost it, okay? It's not there anymore. It's a pity. I, I, I have to ask my daughter to re-record it for me. So they actually go at top speed and each one takes one or two juice at a time. And so therefore they can finish it in, in a, you know, before we, we get, get too hungry, okay? So we all got to listen to the entire Quran. I don't think that we understood the thing, but when we, we heard it and then we got to eat. So many of these houses, still do not use a, a flushing toilet. They have a squatty potty. So this is the potty. So I went up on the hill to take the picture and you can see that, uh, so it has um, a hole and it has a ramp behind it, cemented ramp. So I wanted to do my, my big business and I told my daughter, where is the bathroom? So she showed me, so I went there and I'm looking 
as I did my business. And it's sitting there on the ramp. And I'm looking for the flushing thing and there's no flushing thing. I'm looking for water, there's no water. I mean, there's enough water to wash, but that didn't flush the thing. So I didn't know what to do. So I went out and called my daughter, please, hey, how do I get rid of it? Because it's sitting there on display for everybody to see. So <laughs> what do I do? She said, oh, I don't know. So she went to ask her mom in law. Then she came back and said, don't worry. Twice a day, she will go in there and she has a little rake special for that. And she'll rake it. I said, I, I can take care of it myself. But she said, no, 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 just leave it. Okay. So you see this hole here? This hole, I don't know if you can see the pointer here. So there's this hole, the, the, the ramp leads into this hole. And this hole leads to a little uh, tank. So everything goes into that little tank. And then uh, after everything ferments, they scoop out the stuff from the tank and they use it as fertilizer, okay? And they have these wonderful veggies. And people have been doing that for thousands of years in China and we're they're all alive and doing perfectly fine, okay? And I ate their food, by the way, no problem. So life for semi-rural Muslims is still very hard for many of them. And for my parents-in-law, because their children got they were big on education. Their children got educated, went to the cities, they are doing very well, and they were able to come back and build them this big new house. But otherwise, most of them, as you can see, are still very poor. I went out to the door and I saw this child not in school, you know, shepherding these sheep here. Um, okay, uh, Gansu, for example, this is Landro, the capital of Gansu. They have the beautiful new mosque. And in Pingliang, the small town, we went to this mosque here. As you can see, they still have Central Asian characteristics. All right, section two. I have to go faster now because I think I talk too much. So um, we're going to talk about this also in the next segment. But uh, in the mid uh, Ming dynasty, remember in the beginning, they built mosques and so on, and there were more and more Muslims. But eventually, they realized that the general population, the, 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 the educated gen uh, Muslims were educated in Chinese education but not enough in Islamic education. So there, there, there came a, a guy called Hu Tengzhou who developed a, a special um, curriculum for Islamic education and that spread and he taught uh, a, a number of students. Those students had a second generation student and then third generation and fourth generation student. And those students moved to different cities and spread the, the Islamic institution. And now they have Islamic, the, the specific Islamic institution all over the country, okay? Now, Oh, so this is the uh, one in the Xi'an Great Mosque. Oh, by the way, I put this here because you can see in the background there on the wall, you see those? Okay, so in the bottom here are Chinese words like chi means um, shame or shyness, okay? Uh, xiao means uh, filial piety, being good to your parents uh, and so on. Xin means uh, honesty, right? So these are virtues, Chinese virtues, but look at the top. So in order to look at the top here is, the top is Arabic calligraphy made into Chinese paintings. You see it's all Arabic calligraphy, all of them. And they're made into a Chinese painting. <laughs> Looks very Chinese. It's all Islamic. And because of Arabic being taught at these, uh, these Islamic institutions, they had to do calligraphy and then eventually they developed a Chinese style of doing Arabic calligraphy, and many of them became great artists in their own rights. Um, so if you look at Chinese brushwork, not only we have paintings, Chinese painting, but we also have Chinese calligraphy done in brush and Chinese ink and done on rice paper usually, okay? And we have a long history of adapting other arts into Chinese style. So um, this style has been dubbed not Sini, calligraphy and resembles most closely the Persian one. So these are the regular styles that we know of Arabic calligraphy yet now, and the Persian one is this one, okay? And it resembles the Persian, why, as we know, because the Central Asians had the Persian style and from there it moved to China. And that's why the Chinese style of calligraphy resembles the Persian one the most. Okay. In Chinese calligraphy, the one in the back here is Chinese, right? We have what we call the four trays of writing, the rice paper, the brush, the ink stone, and the ink well. So ink stone is ink dried up into a stone. And then every time you want to write, you have this ink well, you put a bit of water there, and then you grind, 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 it becomes ink. And depending on how much you grind, it could be thicker or thinner. 
okay? And then, of course, you have the brushes. I can see here, this is a brush hanger. I've got one or two of them at home also. And you hang your different size brushes there, and here are the papers you write on. And this, by the way, is a Quran manuscript found in the museum in Kuwait, but it's written actually in the Sunni script, the Chinese script, okay? Dating from the 11th century. Um, all right, here is another one, the Chinese with the translation there. And here, okay. The Chinese scrolls, as you know, are hung vertically as the ones we saw just now of the vases and the flowers. But once they write the scenic calligraphy of, of Arabic uh, inscriptions, they would hang them horizontally. And of course you have to figure out a way of fixing the middle because it tends to sag. And um, I used to have one in, uh, in my home, uh, in my parents' house, and one also in my, my parents-in-law's house. Everybody has one, usually. Because one of my great uncles was also a graduate of an is Islamic institute. So he was good at calligraphy and he would write some for us, you know. <laughs> Um, so we are going to, uh, to, to compare these things here among, between Arabic calligraphy and Chinese Arabic calligraphy. So in Chinese traditional calligraphy, we usually use brushes, horsehair brushes, whereas in Arabic calligraphy, they use hard tip uh, pens in Arabic, like reed stalks, palm tree stalks, and so on, they use those stalks to write Arabic calligraphy, okay? But once it went to China, it changed to brush. And this is my, <laughs> okay. So this guy is a very famous called Bi Guangjiang. Um, and he has been on tours all over the United States as well, uh, doing demos, okay. So we use hemp brushes, grass brushes, silk strand brushes, soft bamboo brushes, and often wrapped in cloth to give it a, a structure, okay. In order to look a bit more like the Arabic writing. So in this way, you can have it a more hard type of writing, less flowy. And because of the, the brush and the cloth, you are able to get that scratchy effect. In Chinese painting or, or calligraphy, they, they value a lot the negative space. So sometimes, if, I don't know if you ever tried Chinese painting, but when you the first thing you teach when I teach Chinese painting is do bamboos, okay? So when you do bamboos, you go sup like that, and it starts with nice and dark and black, but as you go on without re dipping the brush in the ink, it starts getting grayish and become like scratchy with the sort of white in between. And that's done on purpose because it shows the light falling on the bamboo, okay? So you use those spaces on purpose. And now they do that the same with the calligraphy. So here's an example. You can see how here it's nice and dark and then it becomes lighter and lighter. Then he dips the pen again, nice and dark, become light. Whenever it's very dark is where he dipped the, the, dip the, the brush again in the ink. And then you see, we, we, we actually love it when you don't have all black also. It's, it's actually a choice of the artist, how you want to do it. All dark, all dark becoming light. And you can see because now there's a texture. It's not just black, you know, plain black. It has a texture and can see those beautiful textures going up like that. The Chinese use a name chop as a signature. So usually you don't sign your name on the painting or even on your school report card. You go home and that's how the children cheat. They, they steal the chop out of their father's uh, drawer and they go chop it and show it, and bring it back to school, pretending the father saw it, right? <laughs> but they, uh, you sign your name using a name chop. So the Chinese uh, calligraphers also did that. So they would, uh, they would put a name chop in the previous one that we saw here, you saw here at the bottom, he signed his name and put his chop, okay? On the Arabic calligraphy. Um, um, the paper is obviously rice paper, okay? Because the brushes are soft, you cannot use hard paper, they have to use rice paper. And um, the, 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 the special, uh, character of the rice paper is that very pliable, wrinkly, glossy, there are many types, okay? And uh, it's moth proof. The writing ink is, I'm going to go a bit faster, you can read here. So the, you, the, the ink is made, made from tong oil, raw lacquer, pine sap, uh, gelatin, and, um, and musk and borneo, okay? And they made it, make it into this ink. 
this is the very thick type, okay? Where it is thick all the way through. This is an, a Chinese word, but if you look sideways, it's an Arabic word, actually. <laughs> this is a very good one. Um, again, this is a beautiful, you know, flower shape, but made of Arabic words. Um, uh, when an Arab does an Arabic calligraphy, these are the, the, the emphases that they, they have, okay? However, in Chinese uh, Arabic calligraphy, um, it's more important to have a balance and the whole straight line, but you can see how it's very, very flowy. The whole thing is very flowy, okay? Um, right, this is a mask in Zhengzhou, and you can see the calligraphy on top, okay? It's obviously sculpted on or, or engraved on, you know, printed on, so therefore it's not as flowy as the one done directly with brush. Um, normally, um, the mounting for um, Arabic uh, calligraphy would be something like that. And they would use a lot of floor thing and little, uh, you know, the, the harakat uh, as decorations in between and then little uh, abstract decorations around. But in Chinese calligraphy, the mounting is typically uh, like the other Chinese calligraphy. It is a piece of art in itself. So it, you use a lot of negative space. You don't decorate the, the space and you use, um, this is usually silk, of, you know, to, uh, to mount the, the, this one is obviously a vertical one, not a horizontal one. Um, okay, let's skip this one. And modern day calligraphers, of course, have been uh, uh, experimenting with all different kinds of styles, okay? Uh, Haj Nurdin, Mi uh, is the one who has come a lot and is more famous in the West, okay? Because he can speak English, so that's why. <laughs> I mean, he actually is very good, but it doesn't mean that there aren't others. Uh, for the larger pieces, usually they use, you can see here, they, they use harder instruments, but they still cover it with cloth, okay? Okay, this is Mi Guangjiang, Haj Nurdin himself, and he's demonstrating it here. And this also looks like Chinese, but it's actually Arabic. If you look, Al Alamin here, right? Rab Al Alamin. Um, and this is Tawakkal Ta'alallah. This is another guy. Okay, this typical Chinese, like we say, it's uh, from right to left, typically. And look at this one. This is 99 names of Allah. It looks like Chinese again because you have little blocks, okay? But if you look closely, not this one, but another one, each block is an, uh, an Arabic word, okay? Another sample. Okay. Uh, the way they put this on the wall is actually similar to a Buddhist temple or a Taoist temple, okay? But Chinese are Chinese, they do the same thing regardless of the religion. Um, and here's my daughter and my son-in-law visiting Mi Kuan in his studio. Uh, they actually traveled to, to his, um, um, they wanted like a second honeymoon kind of thing. And my son-in-law told my daughter, where do you want to go? Yeah, I want to visit all these Islamic places. So they, so they actually went to visit him in his hometown. Um, this is his studio and all his brushes. He is showing how he uses the, the edge of this thing to write and he demonstrates how he writes. And this is a, the heart, this is the normal Arabic calligraphy using hard tip pen, okay, not the Chinese one. And here is a video demo. <laughs> This is a Rahman al Rahim, you can tell, right? Okay. Now we go to section three, the very special language developed for the Muslim Chinese, okay? Uh, remember, we talked about Hu Tengzhou, who established scripture hall education in the latter part of the Ming dynasty. 
And the fact that many Chinese now were very literate in Chinese literature and other things, but not in Islamic ones. And they were not, and the biggest problem is that they could not read religious text in Arabic or in Persian. So um, he, he evolved this uh, system of education or curriculum um, that originated in Shanxi and they don't spread to Nanjing, to Kunming, uh, to, to Dali in Yunnan and to uh, Linxia. In, this is Lanzhou, it's actually here, this, this area here. And the center of it, of this whole uh, movement was in Xi'an, like we said, his students and the students of his students so spread all over China. Um, during the Qing dynasty, the, uh, if you remember from the history that we talked about last time, there were a lot of conflicts and a lot of upheavals and wars and so on. So uh, the center of education moved then to Linxia here in Northwest China. There is actually an existing Quran written in Jing, Jing Tangyu. So, uh, they developed not just a system of education, but develop a language so that people who didn't know Arabic could read it. Okay. And some people say, oh, it's just uh, a, a, a system of pronunciation. It isn't. Let me explain. So the curriculum uh, uh, um, consists of 14 texts, eight in Arabic, six in Farsi. And in order to make this accessible, they've started with a transliteration system. Okay. But eventually evolved into a language. So the language is an amalgam of Arabic, Farsi, and Chinese. Usually the, the grammar is Chinese, okay? And simple words in between might be Chinese, but the vocabulary, the nouns are Arabic and Farsi, okay? Transliterated. Um, and a lot of uh, specific grammatical structures are actually from a, a, a mixture of Mongolian and the Altai language systems mixed with Chinese language. Let's look, for example, Allah is called Allahu because in the nominative case uh, is Allahu, right? So Allahu. <laughs> I'm going to explain it on why we say Allah and not Allah, right? A friend, this is from Arabic, is from Farsi, Tuosuti. And the second type of vocabulary is uh, uh, Chinese, and uh, where you translate the meaning of something into Chinese, okay? The third type of vocabulary is words related to religion, but they didn't have a word in Chinese for it, so they borrowed it from Buddhism or Taoism, okay? For example, Zhaohua means your, your destiny, your, your, your good fortune, so on and so forth, okay? A Tanwu means a, a level of, a higher level of realization, okay? And so on and so forth. Until now, my, my, my mom and she would say, oh, so and so, Wu Chang le, means he passed away. They wouldn't say Si le, which means die. He would say pa, Wu Chang, which actually is a religious word, okay? Um, so the subjects, objects, and attributes are usually in translated Arabic or Farsi. The verbs are often in Chinese, okay? Example, for example, somebody could say, sabab oh, meaning, oh, I had bad luck kind of thing, right? So the sabab was not good. Ah, ton he, 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 he moved, he aroused his nafs. Nafus, nafus means nafs, meaning he got angry, okay? And then there is a, another system, which is the Chinese words translated into Arabic letters. Okay. Um, oh, wait a minute before we go there. Uh, we are still on here. Okay, sorry. We're still on the translated into Chinese first. So why is Allah, Allah and not Allah? Because if you have a double vowel, if you have double consonant like Allah has two L's, right? So L, double, there's a shadda. So the A before it in Chinese, we don't have double, we don't have shaddas. We have A and we have La. So it sounds like Allah. Okay, it's incorrect, it should be Allah. So they devise a system, it is a rule that if you have a double L, then the A, instead of say A, you say An. So you say An La, meaning double L. And the Hu, by the way, was for the nominative case. Um, I, 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 read, I read another thing written by a guy called Ayub something, and his translation of his name was An Yobu. Why An? Because it is double Y for the well, Ayub, right? It's not Ayub, it's Ayub. So it, it is not Ayubu, it's An Yubu because he has a double Y here. So you can see the transliteration was not haphazard. It had a strict rules as to how to transliterate. But like we said, there is a two-way system. 
many Chinese words were then written in Arabic script, and that is called the Xiao Jing or Xiao Jing sometimes, Xiao Jing. And here are uh, examples, okay? Of, uh, oh, these are examples of previous, uh, for example, here, let's look at Qalam, um, and again, the M is translated as a, we don't say La, we say Lan, meaning Qalam, okay? It's translator system. Um, Mizan here. Uh, okay, this is the one we're talking with, Salat al-Fajr, it's called Bamdad, Pamputa, okay? Uh, and so on. Okay, the alphabet of the charging. So the transliteration from the Chinese to the Arabic system is actually an alphabet of 36 letters, including all 28 Arabic letters, plus four letters from Farsi, plus two letters from Uyghur, and two letters that were created pretty specially to render certain Chinese sounds. Okay. Okay, third women led mosque. It's not there, it's fourth, isn't it? Aren't we on the fourth one now? <laughs> Sorry, it's fourth. Now, women led mosques. Let's start with how many mosques we have in China. So this is one of the rare pieces of evidence we have. This was made in 1990, and we used to have one in our house hanging on the wall. And this map uh, showed the number of mosques in 1990. Now, this number is, I think, wave, too low in 1990, but now it's actually much lower because as you know, in the last few years, suddenly there's a reversal of policy and now they are getting rid of mosques. They are either closing them down or demolishing them. They're getting rid of foreign writing on anything, even restaurants. And so things have changed. So this is a snapshot in time. We're gonna use this for the, 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 the purpose of discussion, but I'm telling you it's not accurate anymore. No, was it accurate then. For example, in Nanjing, where my daughter lives, and as I said, Nanjing was the capital of China in seven different dynasties and during the early Republican era. In the Ming dynasty, they built 11 mosques. During Qing dynasty, they added 24 mosques. That's how many, 35 already. In the Republican era, they built another 13, 48. And they built five female schools slash mosques. During the communist era, another mosque was built so about 40, what, uh, 30, 48, 49. But today, now, the last time I went to Nanjing two days, two years ago, there were only two mosques left out of 49. Incredible, right? It's a pity for history, but uh, we can always rebuild mosques. That's not the problem. And nothing lasts forever. And one day we will rebuild them. But if they demolish them, it's a pity. It's a historical thing lost. So I'm going to show you here, um, in particular, I'm looking at um, Jiangsu number 10. Jiangsu province is where Nanjing is. And according to that map, there were 43. And as, like I said, in 1990, there were not 43, there were 49. So um, let's move on. By the time you finish and you add them and you don't include Hong Kong and Taiwan, you should have in 1990, according to this official thing, 9,806 mosques. And like I said, that was an undercount. Um, look at this map. This is a map of late Qing and early Republican era, distribution of women's mosques, okay? They are called in Chinese, Qingzhen Nu Si, the Puran Temple, women's temple or simply women's temple without the, the parents. Uh, and where did you get this map from? It's from this book written by Maria Jashok and Shui Jingjun and published in 2000. So their, uh, most of their research was done in 1996, in the 95, 96, 97 and so on. And it was published, edited and so on, and finally published 2000, okay? This stirred great interest because in the West or in other countries, most people didn't know of the existence of Chinese women's mosques. So it had, and this um, did not only uh, talk about the mosque, but I mean, mosque is the thing that made everybody pay attention, but also in the subculture of Chinese Muslim women. Um, how many Muslim mosques, women's mosques are there in total? As of 2000, when the book went into print, there was no, official number. But um, the, uh, in the 90s, uh, they started, the government started registering 
any major religion, if you have a religious house, you have to register it formally. And so through these registrations, women's mosques, which were invisible before, suddenly came to the forefront. That's how it suddenly jumped into everybody's consciousness that, oh, do you have something called women's mosques? Okay. And according to Shui Jun, there are about one mosque for every seven men's mosques, there's a women's mosque. Okay. In Henan province alone, there are about 91. Zhengzhou, which is capital of Henan, has 11 of them, four of which have independent mosques and uh, the rest of them being attached to the, the, the main mosque. By 1990, according to that number yeah. we just saw, since there were 9,800 mosques, if you divide that by seven, there should have been about 1,400 women's mosques in China. I don't know how many of them are still there. So this is another map from that book. I, it, it's very, very pale, so I had to highlight it for you. <laughs> you can see where the women's mosques are today. These are the places in the Mongolia, Kansu, Shanxi, Ningxia, Yunnan, and then here, um, here Shanghai and Jiaqi, Jiaxing. Okay. Uh, the publishing they studied was mostly uh, the Hui Muslims, who are Sunni and Hanafi, uh, the traditionalists, the reformists, and the revivalists. Top of them, as we say, the majority are actually attached or semi-attached to the men's mosque, and the minority are independent women's mosques on their own. And it was not until the 90s that they, they came to the forefront because they were officially registered. And people look at the numbers and say, oh, the women's mosque, what is this, right? All right, here is the one in Beijing, uh, in Beijing the one that we showed recently. And this was, uh, you can see in here, this was on the right here, the original inscription, and it was very um, pale. And this one is the new one. So in 1925, it was rewritten again. Okay, it was a new one. All right, women's water room. This was in one of the mosques here. We can see it says women's water room. This is where you go for ablutions. According to my mom-in-law, I remember Sister Azra invited her to give a talk on women's loss at the time and people asked her, so why do you think women involve their own loss? And my mom in law said, very, very simple. That's where we went for our ablutions. Water back in the days, they didn't have running water in the city. Most of houses they didn't have water. They had to have them brought like this from wells or they had to buy it from donkey carts and then still carry it all the way to the house. So water was very precious. And if you had to have your rusol and your, uh, you know, every Friday the men had to have their rusol at, at least every Friday, if not more often, right? And, the, and you had to wash five times a day. Forget about it, it's a big waste of water for them. So the best thing to do, go to the mosque where water was free and everybody would wash in the mosque, right? And when you want to have a bath, go to the mosque. So the mosque, and that's why women had to have separate quarters because all the women come there to have their showers, right? You don't want to be mixing with men going in and out. So that's why women eventually had their own, you know, semi-detached mosque, and eventually this came to uh, evolve into women's own mosques. And again, we can look at mosque ar architecture here, signs here saying "Turn off your cell phones, <laughs> take off your shoes." Um, here is a case study of uh, one mosque in Changying. Uh, it's a small town in Henan. In 1986. There was an original men mosque that was closed down and the women requested the government to give it to them as a women's mosque, so they got it. And there was a lady called Yang Ahund. So Ahund is the name in Persian for Imam. So in China, all the Imams are called Ahund, right? So the, the females are called Nu Ahund, female Ahund, right? And she came with lots of great ideas. I'm going to not just do this, but I'm going to educate all the girls and so on and so forth. And, but there was not much space inside the mosque. They were given a plot of land next to the mosque for a school, but you need funding to build the school. The government never replied to them, never gave them any funding. They tried to apply for foreign funding when a foreign is the, the rich countries in the Middle East, but they never got anything because it was a mosque led by a woman. If it was led by a man, they would have given the funding. So this is uh, one of those pitiful um, uh, um, stories we have because in that area, in, in this small town, 
the girls often drop out from high school very early, get married very early, have lots of children, are not properly educated. And that's why she said, I have to, I have to teach the girls, but she was not able to. Um, um, I'm going to skip because we're really running out of time here. But back in the Ming and Qing dynasty, uh, there was a lot of uh, scholars in, especially in Nanjing actually, a lot of Muslim scholars, and this was their view, very Confucianist view of women. And um, in the early Ming and Qing dynasty evolving, okay. This is a female, uh, female imam here. So they teach not just Islamic knowledge, but also HSRG, sexual education. They sometimes, if, uh, if they have a high level education, then somebody else will do it, but otherwise they would also take care of washing their bodies and so on. And just like any other Imam, if there's some problem in the family, they often ask them to mediate or to solve their problems. And um, where do the female Imams get trained? The, the, the Islamic institutes, um, some of them don't even accept females, but some do, but out of the hundred, there will be one or two female only. And many of them are simply a taught in these uh, Islam, in the mosques, in the, the schools attached to the mosques, okay? Um, what does the mosque do, a woman's mosque? Ablution number one, right? Basic education, women, children, training of the female imams, and other female, uh, and they often also have a daycare for the elderly because women are supposed to take care of the elderly and then they can't do that if they have to do something else, right? Phew, I'm done. Sorry, very long. I hope you didn't fall asleep. That was fast and furious towards the end. I was like scribbling <laughs> notes as fast as I could. So, um, I think we should take the last few minutes just to kind of look through the chat box. I don't think there were questions, but there were quite a few comments that I think I'll share with everybody, um, including Dr. Tung, who was not able to read them. Uh, something about there's, or you know, certain languages being mixes of Persian and Arabic as well. Um, there is somebody expressing sadness uh, about the Chinese government trying to control or change Muslims. Uh, I think we have some questions about that. That's just a comment. Um, so yeah, I don't see any questions proper, but I have, oh, there's a question there from Azra. You wanna unmute yourself? Oh, okay. Um. Um, uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. You had um, mentioned that your father-in-law had wanted to keep up with tradition when main, uh, uh, naming his sons and he went with Mubarak, you know, uh, Mukhtar, but you didn't explain what the mu or the mu was, what, what it referred to. Okay, so remember I told you that the family families have a sort of a mausoleum, a, a sort of a temple thing, where they have a book inscribed with uh, something that the, the founding ancestor, some kind of speech that he wants to leave for his uh, descendants, okay? So that text, you take one word from the text for each generation. So that generation, ma means uh, like uh, abundance, okay? Uh, so that generation was abundance. My son's generation is kai, which means open, okay? Open or open the way for new things or whatever. And so my, my husband wanted to continue the tradition. That's why he called them, he said, we I use ka. At first we tried with a k, uh, but then we said, okay, ka is, will work just as well because there's no ka in Chinese anyway. So that we have qadri qiyam qaid and kamla kazima, karima kiram, right? So that's why we have the ka here. But you know, when I try to ch call the children at home to do something, I ka 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 ka. <laughs> you know how when you're in this problem, you can't come up with the name, your own children. So I started calling number one, number two, number three, number four. So <laughs> what's your name works for me too. It's like, hey, what's your name? Get over here. Yes, that works too. Yeah, um, I had a question about the mythical creatures that were on top of some of those masajid, the sculptures mm -hmm. of that mythical creature with the eyeballs. But um, I just, I, I thought, uh, is it possible that that was permitted because it's living things, like real things with eyeballs that we don't, you know, more conservative Muslims do not depict or sculpt. However, it's a mythical creature, so why not, you know? Right. Maybe that's, that's what they thought. Yeah, it looked to me like a chilin, which is a mythical creature, of, which is like a bit like a lion, a bit like a dragon, something. Mm -hmm. But remember Zheng He, 
uh, the, the navigator, he actually went to Madagascar and he uh, to, Ch to Africa, and he brought back a giraffe with him. And people call it, oh, that's what a Chilean looks like. So they thought a giraffe was a Chilean. Wow. I'm wondering what is the connection here? Maybe there's no connection whatsoever. Maybe I'm just making this up. But it could be because Zheng He brought it. He's a Muslim. If he brought a Chilean, that's fine. Chilean is fine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering if that's the connection. I don't know, you know? All right. My second question is, under the current government, what is the standing of the Islamic Institutes in China? Well, uh, last time I went in 2019, um, I also was supposed to write an article for Islamic uh, Horizons on the status of Islamic education in China. So I actually went and I interviewed somebody who is Communist Party, of course, approved. I mean, I think he was from the Communist Party as well. And he's an official. So I actually interviewed him. So as to have correct numbers and not be for it, you know? <laughs> and yes, a lot of Islamic institutes are still open today and still functioning. I guess they haven't gotten there yet. And um, there's a, but you know, there was a, a school, they used to call them Arabic Chinese schools, okay? Where, which is simply a school for Muslims, but they call Arabic Chinese means. And one of them in, in, in uh, Northwest China, it was called, um, it was first called the Arabic Chinese school where they talk, uh, taught Arabic and English because nowadays you need English, right? So they taught Arabic and English besides Chinese, but eventually because of the restrictions, they were called now a uh, foreign language school. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard that they might actually be forced to abandon Arabic and only teach English. Mm. I am I, I'm not sure about that though. Right? I'm not sure. So I can't say, but yeah. yeah, it's definitely getting worse. Yeah, I wish we could get into the politics of it, but I know like we're out of time. So maybe that could be your part three or your next presentation. <laughs> it's something nobody wants to touch because yeah. since my daughter lives in China, until she leaves there, uh, yeah, you I can. don't want to do anything that might harm their, her, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Are there any other questions from the audience? If not, we really appreciate y'all tuning in during or after your dinner times. And um, we look forward to some further programming by the Islamic Speakers Bureau of Arizona. If you would be so kind as to visit isba.org. And I think it's the top right corner has a big donate button. And if you hit that and donate whatever you can, what what's a cup of coffee these days, right? Then we can inshallah continue providing this kind of programming. Our um, thank you. It's in the chat box, isb-az.org backslash donate uh, to donate directly to the organization because um, we're hoping to bring in-person programming. There are some limited virtual, uh, uh, limited in-person education that we have been able, able to provide during the pandemic. And we hope to go back to our regularly scheduled probe programming now that more and more people are getting their vaccinations and it we hope um, it's going to be safer to get back in person so please do consider clicking on that link and that donate button thank you so much for everybody's attention your participation comments questions and we look forward to hearing from you assalamu alaikum and good night everybody